Hi, welcome to Limnology. In this segment, we'll be discussing the second part of high conductivity or high salinity limnology. And what we're going to be talking about are saline lakes. A lot of people never think about saline lakes, even though saline lakes are about 50% of the volume of lake water on the planet. And if you've been looking at all at uh, the optional readings in Wetzel, you'll notice that despite the huge size of that book, there are only a few pages devoted to saline lakes. But saline lakes are the most common lakes in certain parts of the world. They do have some really unique qualities, and they also have some unique uh, ecological characteristics and unique environmental environmental issues that are confronting them. And so we're going to discuss uh, saline lakes today and learn a bit about those systems that are so common on Earth and yet understudied. So let's talk a bit about where saline lakes are. And if you remember back to the hydrologic cycle, you will remember that uh, there are some parts of the planet where we have more arid conditions and where there's not as uh, high a, uh, excess water balance and rivers don't flow to the sea. And most of our saline lakes are found in these semi-arid regions where you get about 20 to 50 centimeters per year um, of precipitation. And some are in arid regions, um, although it can be hard for them to persist there. Um, so these are the endorheic, the places where rivers are arising but not flowing to the sea, and the aerheic areas that we discussed, regions where there may just be temporary rivers uh, during flooding. And together, these are a substantial portion of the planet. About one-third of the planet's nonpolar land surface is in an endorheic or aerheic area, and, and you can see those as dark pa patterns on the, the slide here. And so it's important to discuss the lakes that are, that are most common on a third of the Earth's surface. If we um, think about it, there also are some lakes that are going to be salty in other regions. As, as residents of Syracuse right now, you guys know that we have some uh, traditional salt sources here, and there's salt mines near some of the Finger Lakes. And so you can have salt lakes near here. We have some salt pools just because you're near a salty uh, layer um, that's exposed to surface water. Um, Again, half of the water in the world's lakes is fresh and about half is saline. And this is a figure uh, from a paper where they were looking at large lakes. And you can see that the, the distribution of the large lakes on, on Earth in terms of their spot on the planet from the equator going up to the poles. And most of them are sort of uh, either right at the tropics or in this temperate area. And you can see though that most of the saline lakes are gonna be right in those areas we talked about as being most dry, um, about 30 degrees north and south of the equator in those horse latitudes in those um, endorheic regions. So saline lakes have some pretty interesting characteristics and just a few of those random uh, sort of uh, party facts that you can learn about saline lakes. Um, the first is that the saline lakes include the largest lake on the planet, the Caspian Sea, um, which contains 75% of the world's saline lake volume. Um, and that's actually five times the surface area of Lake Superior, um, which is the largest lake by surface, freshwater lake by surface area. Saline lakes also include the highest lake um, on the Tibetan Plateau, which is uh, over 4,000, almost 5,000 meters above sea level. And they include the lowest lake, the Dead Sea, um, which is actually below sea level. Um, so if there were a channel to the sea, water would flow into the Dead Sea. And we'll actually mention that later. Um, they also are much less studied, um, partly because the water is too saline for drinking or irrigation, um, but the river water, going into these lakes may be utilized by people, and uh, that'll be one of the effects we talk about of humans, just like we mentioned the Errol Sea case study earlier in the class. So what are some of the characteristics generally of these saline lakes, and what makes a saline lake saline? How salty does it have to be? So to be considered a freshwater lake, a lake should have less than one half a part per thousand of, uh, sol of dissolved salts in it. 
to be a subsaline lake or not quite a saline lake, you'd have between 0.5 and 3 parts per thousand. And that's an interesting breakpoint um, because it's the point at which um, it, you often would taste the water as being salty at about 3 parts per thousand. And it also tends to be an important uh, breakpoint for where certain organisms can live, where you start getting that brackish water that organisms don't do well in unless they have special adaptations. So your saline lake, if you have greater than or equal to 3,000 milligrams per liter or three parts per thousand of salinity, that key break point. And this is also a point, if you're a chemist, at which certain chemical equilibria change. We talked about uh, some of the interactions of ions and how ions might be made less available under certain saline conditions due to all of those electrostatic interactions. And that three parts per thousand is a key component for those uh, chemical reactions too. Even though we're not going to talk much about that today, it's good to know that three parts per thousand has a lot of significance and is a good choice for where things become considered saline. But not all saline lakes are the same salinity. Unlike the ocean, which has a pretty constant salinity between open water areas um, and has minor variations, but not huge variations, saline lakes may really differ in a lot of ways. So those that are three to 20 parts per thousand are considered under saline or hyposaline because they're less salty than seawater. Those that are around the level of oceanic, sea, oceanic uh, salinity, around 33 parts per thousand, or between 20 and 50 parts per thousand, are considered middle salinity or mesosaline. And those that are greater than 50 parts per thousand are hypersaline. And there are some super, super saline lakes. Uh, there are some lakes that are uh, 270 parts per thousand in Australia. Um, so if you think about it, you're talking about things that are many, many times the salinity of seawater. And in Antarctica, there's some extremely saline lakes. And you may remember us discussing how ice will remove fresh water. So it makes sense that you're left with a sort of very briny lake in some places where it's so cold and ice may have removed extra fresh water. And you will also remember that salt water is more dense than fresh water. And so there's a classic picture of someone sitting reading a newspaper on the Dead Sea um, and not having to work to float themselves because that's such high um, density water that you're able to float very easily. You're more buoyant there. Also, um, it's less likely that you're going to have salt lakes freeze uh, because as you increase salinity, you're going to decrease the temperature at which you'll freeze salt water. In addition, a lot of times these lakes have high pH. And you'll definitely remember from our, some of our chemistry parts of the class um, that carbonates and other materials can increase the uh, pH or make lakes more basic. And so that makes sense that some of these dissolved materials and dissolved salts could increase the pH, make it less acidic. Unlike the ocean, where the balance of the different ions tends to be very constant, the major ions, salt lakes may really differ. You may have some that are dominated by sodium and chloride. You may have some that are dominated by potassium and carbonate and, and all kinds of other combinations. So salt lakes do not have the same types of ions in different lakes. Often they have high nutrient levels. You might think, well, why would they have high nutrient levels? They tend to look sort of clear. Um, well, they have high nutrient levels just for the same reason they have high salts. Everything's been coming into there and being concentrated and leaving us with lots of the, the, the nutrients are not evaporated with the water and you're left with concentrated nutrients just like concentrated salts. And along with that, you often get high levels and potentially toxic levels of some trace metals. Uh, anything that's been brought into the lake from the watershed is going to be concentrated in the lake as the water's evaporated in these arid areas. And they tend to have low oxygen. And hopefully you remember back to learning that salt water holds less oxygen at equilibrium with the atmosphere than fresh water. So oxygen concentration is even more of a problem in salt lakes um, than it is in freshwater systems. And interestingly, um, almost all species that we find in salt lakes seem to be evolutionarily derived from freshwater species, not from marine species, which seems counterintuitive to a lot of people uh, because we think, well, it's salty, so maybe they should have come from the ocean. Um, and as we increase salinity, we get fewer and fewer species that can live there, so we get 
fewer numbers of species in those lakes. And we tend to get certain types of algae that deal better with being in high salinity waters than others. And these tend to be some of the blue-green algae, the, cyan the cyanobacteria, um, some of the diatoms or the Bacillariophyta, and some of the green algae. And you can see this graph, it's not a great correlation, but you get many, many more species, sometimes 100 species of algae in freshwater lakes um, at any given time, whereas you might only have one or two species of algae dominating all of the phytoplankton um, in, a, uh, in a salt, very salty lake. That's true for other types of species as well. This graph shows the zooplankton in circles and the organisms living, the benthic invertebrates living on the bottom as the little crosses or plus symbols. And you can see the same pattern. As you increase salinity, you go from having numerous species to having maybe just one, two, or three species that are able to live in these very saline lakes. And the species that can live in these salt lakes often are found widely in many different salt lakes. Um, and Many times people confuse low numbers of species or sort of species, poor species richness with something that's not productive. And again, we've got to think back to our definition of productivity, the amount of biomass that's produced in an area per time. And just because there aren't many things present, not many types of things present, doesn't mean that those types of things, those few types of things that live there can't grow rapidly. And you can just think of the analogy to uh, a terrestrial agricultural system. You know, a, a cornfield may just have corn in it pretty much, but it can be very productive. So don't uh, confound the fact that there are few species with, with thinking that it has to be not productive. They can be very productive. And we said they're high nutrient levels. If they live there, they have very few competitors because other things aren't able to live there. So it can be great for those few number of species that can live there. There's also a lot of work these days on salt-loving microbes um, and some of their unique characteristics. And with modern genetic tools, we can learn a lot more about them. Um, and so some of the main research being done today on salt lakes is on these um, salt-loving microbes. Sometimes you can get dramatic blooms. Um, so some of these green algae have uh, carotenoid pigments that can make them appear red. And this is just a fantastic image uh, from the National Geographic showing a salt lake in, in Kenya um, and the phytoplankton bloom, pretty much of one species of green algae expressing this red pigment that's turned all of these waters red. It's not a toxic algae. Um, it's just this small uh, green flagellated algae. Um, and it's so abundant, so productive, even though there's this one species that you can really see the redness in the color of the water. There are a few really um, sort of typical um, interesting organisms that live in salt lakes. And one of the classic ones is shown here, uh, brine shrimp. But we also have a few fish that are able to live um, in salt lakes. Um, they can't live in the saltiest lakes, um, but they can live in saline lakes. Um, there are a few species of tilapia. Some of you may have uh, eaten tilapia. It's a very common aquaculture uh, fish. and. Uh, grown around the world. And one cichlid fish or mouth brooding fish, uh, Oreochromis, can live in moderately saline waters and in the wetlands fringing them. And often people will introduce fish into those moderately saline lakes uh, to use as food. Uh, and we have this brine shrimp um, or Artemia that it occurs in fishless saline lakes. And so think about like why would this be only in fishless lakes if you've seen a brine shrimp? Um, and hopefully you can answer that it would be there because they're fairly large and they're fairly slow. And we talk about fish as being visual predators that are going to be able to capture something that's big, see it better, um, and they're not going to be able to escape. And these are Artemia. They tolerate high salinity. They can have oxygen um, storing pigments. You can see the slightly reddish tinge there, like hemoglobin. And that can help them, as we've discussed in other sections, be able to tolerate the low oxygen conditions there. And some of you may be familiar with Artemia or brine shrimp uh, from aquaculture, because it's often used as a food for small fish. But others of you may have grown them as uh, sea monkeys, if you saw this little ad in the back of a comic strip as a kid. Um, and uh, they sold you a bunch of little eggs that then you put in a little container and you did not actually hatch a bunch of little monkeys that looked like this and uh, played the guitar or were a happy little family. But what you hatched were a bunch of things that looked like this image here. So those sea monkeys that you were sold were the resting eggs or the resting stages of these um, 
pelagic or open water swimming zooplankton, the brine shrimp that live in salt lakes. And you hatch them when you got those eggs. In addition, there are often flamingos associated with some of the tropical salt lakes. Um, and flamingos are really interesting birds. They'll actually retain some of the pigments from those algae to produce their color. And they have special uh, bills and mouth parts that are uh, made to help strain the filamentous phytoplankton that can bloom in these lakes. Um, and so Lake Nakuru in Kenya is well renowned for having this uh, famous um, high um, flamingo population. Um, and it also has some uh, issues with water quality. Um, Lake Nakura is um, found in the Eastern Rift Valley in Eastern Africa. That's also famous for being the, uh, some of the places where we found uh, fossils of early hominids. And in addition, we've discussed this region when we've talked about Lake Victoria and Lake Tanganyika and so forth in, in these rift areas and the Lake Victoria between them. And so, so Lake Nakuru in this region has a huge population of um, flamingos and they end up consuming the matter from this very simple food web. So they can consume the algae and they can consume some of the copepods that are eating these algae. Most of the algae in, in the lake are spirulina um, that bl bloom quite a bit. And we mentioned spirulina in the phytoplankton section of the course. Uh, you might have made spirulina powder, gotten spirulina powder to put into your smoothie or into your uh, orange juice. Uh, you were eating the same base of the food web as a flamingo if you did that. There also are some introduced fish in the lake and uh, some small invertebrates as well, but a pretty simple food web that then feeds these um, flamingos uh, as well as the fish feeding some, uh, some pelicans. So you've got these uh, really important, small, simple food webs. And this is another kind of reason that people study um, salt lakes as opposed to having hundreds of species of algae and you know, 20, 30 species of zooplankton and trying to figure out the patterns in a complex system with many players, you can look at this system that's dominated by a few species and really try to model the system and figure out what's going on and look at the responses of the system to environmental perturbations more easily than many of our freshwater lakes. And here's the bill of the flamingo uh, that's adapted to strain out those filamentous spirulina and some of the invertebrates from the water. And Lake Nakuru has periodically through the past about 20 years and even historically undergone lake level fluctuations, uh, both due to water use in the basin, but also due to um, patterns in, in climate uh, where we go through drier and wetter seasons. And those lake level fluctuations when the lake is drawn down to lower levels and the, it's more concentrated have led to periodic flamingo deaths. Um, and those aren't due to the salinity, there still are algae in, in the lakes, um, there still are algal blooms, so it's not a direct food web effect. Um, and people have investigated to some extent what's causing those die-offs because really the flamingos drive the tourism for, uh, trade in Lake Nakuru. And so some of the major hypotheses people are trying to determine um, between, decide between and test between are whether the concentration of heavy metals in the low water periods or human pollution from all of the development on the, on the, in the basin or perhaps favoring some toxic algae um, in the system may be responsible for these deaths. Uh, the last big die off was in 2006 um, and uh, this still hasn't been fully resolved but is an area that people uh, internationally are studying. Another simple food web that's been studied a lot is in Australia, and it's almost hard to believe this is like a little test you would do in the lab. This Lake, lake Werewap is very, very um, saline, and it's really dominated by just a few types of algae um, and a few types of, of animals, including the Coronamid, Tanitarsis, and uh, Brachytonis, Brachionis uh, plicatilis, uh, a rotifer. Um, and so this is a really nice, simple food web that uh, theoretical ecologists can study and look at basic ecological patterns in these systems. 
One more practical reason that people might look at salt lakes is that humans often have big impacts on them. Often these lakes are in areas that are rich in deposited and built up uh, minerals. So just salt itself, we tend not to think of salt as being such a limiting factor. Uh, but in the 1800s and previously, um, salt was really something that drove patterns of human civilization. In fact, you may learn or have learned that Syracuse itself was in part settled in this region because there were salt springs that people could use to produce salt from. And if you bought salt in the United States in the late 1800s, it was likely to have come from Syracuse, New York. Similarly, these salt lakes were often seen as valuable because they were a salt of salt. And salt wasn't just used uh, as a seasoning, it was also used as a preservative before refrigeration. And so it was a really valuable commodity. And so we've mined minerals, we've mined salt, uh, we've mined things like uranium um, and lithium and borax and other materials from the salt deposits around Salt Lakes and from Salt Lakes itself. Um, we've harvested phytoplankton, such as spirulina, from salt lakes, although increasingly the spirulina that you buy in the store would be, would be uh, something that would be grown in outside uh, salt ponds that people had produced in a more aquaculture sense. And we also have harvested animals from, from, uh, from salt lakes. Uh, there's a uh, large amount of business. In fact, it uh, was over $15 million per year that was gained uh, from mining brine shrimp out of uh, the salt, Great Salt Lake uh, through the 90s and early 2000s. Um, and again, sometimes brine shrimp are introduced intentionally into other areas in order to um, allow that industry to occur in those regions. And this is a slick of brine shrimp resting eggs, those sea monkey eggs on the surface that you can see on the left, and those can be skimmed from the surface or mined from the sediments after they sink. And that whole net on the right-hand side is filled with eggs of brine shrimp. Some of them would go to people like you when you were a kid growing sea monkeys, but most of them would go to aquaculture facilities where they would hatch those brine shrimp and feed them to small fish that they were raising. Because these lakes are in these endorheic regions that barely have a water balance that's allowing streams to leave the lakes, um, they are very susceptible to small changes in the hydrologic cycle that would alter the water balance. So if they go into a dry period, you might really dry up these lakes. And we've seen this just within recent human history. So here's a picture from the same site as that picture of the people swimming in the Great Salt Lake. Now that part of the Great Salt Lake just a couple years ago was completely dry. Um, there's a person standing where they were swimming. Um, and so as we predict different changes occurring in the amount of rainfall fall, falling on various regions, those regions that have lakes that are salty and may not have much water input into the system have lakes that are in danger of drying up very rapidly um, with a small loss in the amount of precipitation that occurs in these already arid regions. And in many of these systems, there are records of previous eras um, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years ago even, where the lake levels were very different than those today because the climate was different in those places. So these lakes can be a good record of climate change in the past and places where people are forecasting big changes in lakes um, due to climate change in the future. And we already mentioned the Aral Sea example earlier in class in the hydrologic cycle section, but these salt lakes are under threat of diversion of water, not just loss of water in terms of precipitation due to climate change, but also loss of water as humans are using river water that's entering the lakes um, and using it for human needs, drinking water, or more often irrigation. Um, and it makes sense that people would rely on this river water to irrigate local uh, farms and to irrigate other, um, other potential sources of revenue like cotton farms. Um, as we talked about in the Aral Sea, um, but that has huge effects on the lakes. And so two more case studies uh, related to some of these lakes are the Dead Sea, um, that's historically significant. Some of you will have known of the Dead Sea um, from uh, reading of uh, some of the beginning of human and Western civilization, um, and uh, Mono Lake in California. And some of you may have seen Save Mono Lake bumper stickers. 
So Mono Lake is a graben lake. Think to yourself, what were graben lakes again? How were they formed? And you may remember graben lakes are formed when you have those two fault zones and essentially then you drop uh, the, the bottom of the lake down and have these steep sided rectangular deep lakes. And this is in, uh, in Israel, modern day Israel, and it's very saline. There are only about 50 millimeters on average of rainfall that falls on this region per year. And for centuries, this lake was meromictic. So remember again, back to meromixes, meromictic lakes have a fresh water on the surface and salt water on the bottom that doesn't mix. And the reason it was meromictic wasn't like some of the lakes we talked about where a salt layer came underneath fresh water or built up under fresh water. But in this case, the river water formed a fresh water lens over the bottom waters of lakes. And the, just like in some of the other situations we've talked about, inflow from rivers was diverted for agriculture. And so this caused there to be a reduction of the freshwater lens. Um, there was always a southern basin that was really salty, those precipitated little salt uh, uh, mounds that you saw earlier were from the southern basin. But the northern basin was Meromictic, had this freshwater lens, and people would visit and found that the waters were healing, it was an area of resorts and so forth. And if we look at, again, this is a complicated lake in a sense to look at a graph of because it's the meters below sea level, but if we look as it gets like to fewer le meters below sea level, the lake level is actually getting higher. So if we look from 1800 when we had some records being taken uh, to when we had actual good gauging in the early 1900s and onward, uh, we'll show you a number of, of areas here. You can see the, the lake level um, changing, uh, going up and down based on floods, and then going down greatly as the river water starts to be diverted in the early 1900s. And the, the river water um, is causing the lake level to decline. The freshwater lens is being evaporated away. That continues. And we see something dramatic happening in 1980, then a little bit of increase as there was a floody area. And that really changed the density and salinity. So you've seen a lot of these graphs showing parameters across the top um, and going down with depth. And what we see here is our row looks like a little p, our density and our salinity and our temperature. And you can see then that the salinity, we had this freshwater lens, this low density lens, all of those uh, graphs that are showing lighter water at the top and uh, denser water at the bottom and it was warmer water at the top and slightly cooler water at the bottom and then as we go from 1975 to 76 as we go down to 77 to 70 December of 77 you can see that the the density difference between the surface and the bottom keeps declining 78 it's almost no density difference and then boom in 79 when we get to the bottom there there's no density difference and no temperature difference between the top and bottom that freshwater lens of low density water that's high temperature water because it's exposed to the sun um, that came from the river has evaporated away the water has been diverted for agriculture and we end up having uniform density top to bottom and you guys all know what happens when you have uniform density from top to bottom then the lake will mix there's no resistance to mixing and so that meant that this lake that for centuries and centuries had been meromictic and all of the stuff stored in the bottom and you guys remember learning that when oxygen runs out in these salty layers at the bottom then the microbes start using alternate electron acceptors, nitrate, and so forth, and finally they get to sulfate, and they start making sulfides. So you can also imagine what it smelled like in 1979 when this lake started turning over, and all these sulfides and this rotten egg smell uh, were brought to the surface at these resort areas um, along the shore of the Dead Sea. So the surface water uh, became more and more salty, and evaporation increased the salinity. And in 1979, when there was no density difference, you had mixing. And then you had uh, increase in river water for a bit, and it became meromictic with this little freshwater lens over the surface from into the early 80s. And then it mixed annually um, after that for some period of time. And we can see that here, if we look at, remember, our whole lake stability, this is a great review for you guys. We go 
from having no lake stability at the begin whole lake stability at the beginning of 79 and then we have pretty high stability during the season where we're getting water input in 80 and 81 and so forth so it's resisting mixing and then as we get to 1982 and 83 you see that in the dry season you have no fresh water lens and there's no resistance to mixing and so the lake is turning over every year there for a while and then in 1991 to 92, the, in, there was an increase in, in lake level because there was a really wet period and it became meromictic again. And then since 1995, it's mixed annually. And in fact, there's big concern due to this sort of historical importance of, um, of the uh, Dead Sea for humans. Um, it's mentioned in the Bible and it's been important uh, in Greek and Roman history and uh, in the his whole history of the Middle East region and historically in human habitation of that region going back for, for long periods of time, um, that there's actually been proposals to uh, maybe make a pipeline to the Red Sea and bring ocean water to, it would be all downhill, to the Dead Sea to fill it up again. That would obviously change the lake quite a bit, um, but not let the lake dry up because the water level in the lake is actually going down and down and down. And in fact, if you go to one of the resorts now, you have to war walk quite a bit to get to the Dead Sea. The lake is really in danger of drain draining and drying up. So this is in an, even a, a region that had a lot of local economies driven by the history of the Dead Sea, driven by resorts on the Dead Sea and the healing powers that were thought to exist on the lake. Uh, you can see the rapid change that would occur just within a few decades to where the lake is uh, perhaps in danger of drying up and people are debating plans uh, to, to to determine if they can fill this sea. It would have a much different character if it were actual seawater that were brought to the region, region as opposed to lake water, but it might at least restore the lake there. So you can look into the references that were listed about this case study to see more about this active debate. One closer to home, uh, some of you may have been to Mono Lake. Um, that's just a east of the Sierras, uh, sort of near San Francisco. Um, and it's a very old lake. Uh, some, some of the um, sediment cores that were done for this, from this lake show that it's either half a million or a million years old. Right from, uh, there was a lake there right from the time of the uh, uh, volcanic action that, that formed this region. Um, although there's also some really active um, volcanic um, action that's occurring now. So there's some islands there that are very, very young, um, just like several thousand years and old. Um, and what happened here was Los Angeles, even though this is closer to San Francisco than it is to Los Angeles, um, Los Angeles has diverted the drinking water, uh, the rivers that flow into Mono Lake for drinking water. Um, and this has happened in a number of the uh, regions of uh, California where drinking water is a really limiting factor. So we've talked about how in the Northeast we have a really difficult time thinking of water as a limiting resource, that we live in this really wet region, we have this glacial history that's left us with a lot of lake basins, and we take for granted that we get pretty much free fresh water. Most of us don't pay that much for our fresh water. But in many parts of the world, the situation situation is very different and water can be very limiting to human habitation. And especially in the Southwest, one of the things that is a real problem in terms of human habitation of the area is the ability to get sufficient water to not only have drinking water, but water for irrigation, water for industrial processes that's sufficient to meet the large demand of populations in those arid places. And so this is a case where Los Angeles in advance thought about taking water from other regions, some of which were agricultural regions and diverting their rivers to Los Angeles. And there's a couple of great books and some references that are listed about that whole, the whole politics of that process um, that continues to this day. So one of the players in that debate in our own country is Mono Lake. And you may have also heard of Mono Lake because it's a big tourist attraction. If you look at these crazy sort of otherworldly little um, uh, precipitates that are forming here, these are called Tufa Towers. Um, and so you may have seen postcards or images of these. And people will come to this really remote, arid region, uh, sort of near on the other side of the Sierras from uh, Yosemite, in order to see this crazy, sort of otherworldly looking lake. And again, this has a really simple food web. It has a few kinds of algae. It has a brine shrimp and a brine fly, so the artemia and a brine fly. And then it has a lot of waterfowl, um, so a lot of bird watchers go there. And it used to have a big tourist industry. 
You also may recently have heard of Mono Lake because last year there was a really splashy paper um, that indicated that perhaps there were some bacteria that could incorporate um, arsenic into their um, nucleic acids instead of phosphorus. Um, and there, you should know there are some references listed as well that um, that study actually had some flaws in it and it turns out this bacterium is actually just very tolerant of arsenic um, and there was probably, it's really, really good at taking up low phosphorus and so it was taking up some, uh, can, likely was taking up some phosphorus that was contaminated um, in the cultures as opposed to um, taking up arsenic and being able to make DNA in a whole new way. So, but it's uh, still an interesting case of these high, um, high trace metals that occur in these, in these lakes maybe selecting organisms that might be useful in terms of remediation or living in high toxin environments. So there's a lot of work again on these microbes in these lakes. So here's the brine shrimp in the hand there. You can see the two little eye spots and the line is the gut of the brine shrimp. So they've eaten a lot of algae. And then on the right, you see some of the tufa towers in the background and one of the islands, one that was recently formed in the middle on the lower right. And then on the lower left, you see this bird that's actually eating these brine flies that are emerging. All those little dots in front of it are brine flies that have emerged from the lake. Their larvae live in the lake and as adult they fly around and they are really important food uh, for these birds. They also were historically as larvae, the indigenous people in the region would collect these fatty larvae of the brine flies uh, and use them as a supplemental food in rough times. So when you divert a river and basically turn the river into this little pipeline heading to Los Angeles, you obviously are going to change the salinity of the lake because you're removing freshwater impact, it, freshwater input. And that can have uh, different effects on brine shrimp and brine fly. They will mention some of the ranges. Once you get too salty, then you won't be able to have brine shrimp and brine fly live. They have different tolerances. Obviously, the stream fish themselves um, are going to be detrimentally affected by having the water taken away. Um, and then you're going to change the um, near shore zone, the littoral zone. So the brine fly state tends to stay near shore, the brine shrimp, and it's attached to surfaces. The brine shrimp is in the open water, so it still has habitat even when some of the near shore zone is exposed. Um, then some of the birds that live there and the aquatic vegetation may have uh, negative effects of changes in water level or positive effects of changes in water level. And one thing that uh, was was determined as well was that the dust that was exposed as the lake level uh, declined, all of those precipitated salts made dust that blew around. And just like in the Aral Sea example we talked about, that dust can be sort of caustic and harmful to human health. And also the two foot towers that are the attraction for tourists may be exposed if the water level is too low, so there no longer is groundwater and, and salt input that's growing the tufa towers, um, or they may be um, flooded if the lake level were too high and they'd be underwater and then you might not be able to see them. And so there's been a little battle between the local people and some other residents of California and Los Angeles about the water level and the amount of water that should be able to be removed and what the correct water level was. And the approach that was taken was that um, authorities called in the National Academy of Science to measure and quantify these effects. And so they looked at effects of diversion. Some of these effects included different lake level simulations. And in some of the simulations, you can see as you make the water level from the upper left down to the lower left, to the upper right, to the lower right, the make le lake level lower and lower and lower, you attach the island to the mainland. And you think, okay, like what would that do? Well, that would, uh, those birds are almost all breeding on that island, those islands, because that's a place that coyotes and other organisms can't get to easily. And so once those islands are connected to the mainland, then that really can reduce bird um, success, nesting success, because all the eggs get eaten. They mapped all the tufa towers to see which ones were exposed, what the different lake levels would do to them. And then they really tried to quantify at different lake levels, going from uh, the lowest lake levels to the highest lake levels, would the resource 
that's of each of those resources, brine shrimps, brine flies, different types of birds, the tufa towers, the air quality, the shoreline vegetation and riparian vegetation and the fish that are in the streams, those, there are no fish in the lake itself. Would the resource be maintained or would it be slightly affected or basically would the resource be eliminated? And say, could we make some decisions based on the need for Los Angeles region to have water, fresh water, there are a lot of people who live in Los Angeles and they'd like to keep living there, um, versus the functions of this lake and what would be perhaps a good compromise. And so the scientists were really able to make pretty good predictions of these ecosystem effects. But in the end, none of them was really important for regulation because both sides were really fighting it out. The laws that applied, the main thing that caused the water level agreement was the air quality. So human health, the people living in the region, the tourists who came to this region were gonna be affected by this dust exposure. And there are clean air standards that were being violated at certain lake levels. And so from all of these, this nice work that was done and in your uh, handout, there's a list of some of these uh, studies, including this National Academy of Science report. You can see the air quality effects and that what was, was what was used to come to a compromise. Um, and so they agreed on a regulated level um, and the lake level has increased. They've reduced the river um, diversion, uh, but it hasn't reached the level that it was supposed to have reached uh, several years ago yet. So there's ongoing litigation about this. And so you can go to Mono Lake today and see this and you'll see various signs talking about this. You can float in there the same way you can float in the Dead Sea and collect brine shrimp and brine flies easily. And it's a really amazing tourist site and it's a really good example of how we can have a really good scientific understanding of all of these issues. And in the end, uh, the action that occurs is going to always be a balance of uh, our knowledge of the system and the ability of people to sort of agree on what the decisions that they think should be implemented are. So it's a really good example of the scientists being able to inform the players in the game and those people, the local people by Mono Lake and the people of Los Angeles and the state of California, as well as the people regulating air quality could use that scientific information to come to a regulatory agreement and be able to try to restore some of the ecosystem function at the same time as uh, maintaining uh, some of the water diversion for Los Angeles. And many people may disagree with decisions made, uh, but it's a great example of the scientists having a good handle on the direct effects of lake diversion and all of these different ecosystem processes. So uh, we can see that salt lakes are really interesting. They have a unique biota. Many theoretical ecologists study salt lakes because of their simple food webs. Many people can benefit from these salt lakes for tourism or from extracting brine shrimp or for some of them that are less salty, extracting tilapia. Um, and they constitute half of the lakes uh, in terms of volume on the planet. And they'll really be impacted by slight climate change and large climate change uh, over time. We'll discuss them again a bit in the paleoecology section, uh, but now you won't be eliminated Knowledgeist who's learned nothing about salt lakes um, and I encourage you to uh, think about them if you go traveling around the world you're bound to go to a region uh, that has salt lakes and visit one and look at their unique characteristics. Thanks and that's the end of uh, high conductivity limnology. Thanks for joining us and I'll see you next time.